depending on the circumstances, the build up to the season now is different for so many on the 360 agenda. A savage double blow for Collingwood as two tools fall ahead of Friday's season opener. As Heath Shaw prepares to restart his career as a giant, we'll chat about the twist in his journey. And a day after losing Dean Bailey, his friend Brenton Sanderson joins us as the Crows launch their season in trying circumstances. I'm Jared Waitley, he's Mark Robinson. This Wednesday night, it's footy from all angles. Mm. Robbo, an extra treat tonight with F1 great David Coulthard coming in. I can't wait to uh, meet him. Have you prepared? I prepared a little, yes. Yeah. I, I could don't take let a me stab go, at your favourite topics. Don't let me go too far. If I if I do, just lean over and give me a Pull bit up. of a tap. Okay. okay. There's a lot of excitement in the corridors of Fox Footy tonight. It's certainly more boisterous than it normally is. Can I guess why? McClure and King. No, no, no. As well as oh. Bounce. Bounce is oh, the bounce to is Wednesday here. Sorry. nights immediately after us <laughs> on 360. Andrew Gaze has been handed the pep up. This is upstairs there they now. Are. These are live shots. Oh, you just never know. We've both been part of this and the mad cat mayhem that can unfold. Yes. Now it will unfold. In what, the, the preparation or in what? Oh, I just... No, on the show. That if there was ever no holds barred TV, this is it. I would have thought, I'll go, I, the bounce is great, but I would have thought no, no holds barred TV. Give me McClure. Okay, well, it's a good double billing. It is then, a I double billing. Nights. The bounce into McClure. It'll be great to see him for the first time this year. A Wednesday love, Robbo. My love tonight is Anthony Morabito, oh. and I don't know him and I don't love him, but I love the fact that he's been able to get back on the park. This is Morabito playing for, I think that's the Peel Thunder. Looks like they're colours, I might be wrong. Have a look at him. He looks strong again. He just looks like a young. Look at that. Just bursting through. If he can get back on the park, so, so happy for him and so happy for his family and for the footy club. When do you think, when could it happen if everything holds together? What's he had, three? He doesn't need to be back playing senior football just yet. What he needs to do is to go, in my opinion, is to go out there and play five, six, seven weeks of football. Get used to the bumps, because he's going to get sore after games and stuff. Get used to the bumps, get his confidence back up. I don't think Ross Lyon needs to play him before then. If he gets up and going and he was going to be the player that we thought he was going to be, um, I'm looking forward to seeing Morabito play around 18, 19, 20, oh, okay. 21. Not when he first comes back yeah. in, but that's oh, when he's yeah, going to yeah, be at yeah. his more comfortable, get yeah. his confidence back. What about Carry you? a lot of goodwill. But, Look, I love the club ads that are done at this time of year for a few reasons. Some for cheesy acting. I'm not against cheesy acting. Some for the story that clubs are trying to tell. And it's all about the tone and the gravitas. No doubt. So the Bulldogs, of course, went to the man most likely, Bob Murphy. A common bond runs through these streets. Out across Melbourne's west. It runs red, white, and blue. It brings together all, young and old. Gather the pack. Pretty damn good. Well, you listen to that and you think, oh, just not quite. Oh, not I'm not going to be so negative, but. What you're really okay. missing is? is say, a 10 year old, Lexi to really hit the story of the Western Bulldogs. A common bond runs through these streets, out across Melbourne's west. It runs red, white and blue. It brings together all, young and old. And if you're thinking, well, you have to go with the ladder there, you're not no. alone. Amateur. The Bulldogs. So Bob last night resigned from the Players Association. He's injured and trying, and now he's, yeah, he's been, been sacked sad. from the club ad. Comparing the young fellow, what was his name, Lexi? That was amateur hour from Bob. There's no feeling in it. <laughs> no feeling. It was like reading a script. Gather the pack. Come and watch us play. At least Lexi had a little bit of the 
bit of stuff growl. that we want as fans. A bit of growl at the end too. Uh, nice. Well so, done, Lexi. Great let's effort. get into the agenda. And Friday night has very much been reshaped by Collingwood's training session today. All eyes were on the fitness of the pies, and this is right at the forefront of contemplations. The West Australian today fit. Pies will test Frio. We spoke about Hang Ben on, Reed where did they get that and Jesse from? Wright. Well, this was beforehand. That's so what that not, changed. Not quite so fit anymore. Well, neither, neither really participated Ben Reed and Jesse White. And then, rather than the nonsense that usually yep. goes on, they just went, "No, nope, calf injuries." Not playing. Yeah, well done, Colin. The first thing I want to say, well done. They could go on all the way through tomorrow. They've ruled them out. I don't, I don't think Bucks plays those sort of games. Um, doesn't that change? Doesn't that change? We're, we're, we're talking about either the bookends, which I don't think they were going to be. We're talking to the two guys we're going to play beside Travis Cloak yep. Friday night. Now everyone's going to say, oh, geez, Travis, you're going to get off the leash a bit. We're going to have all this great support. The agility of probably Jesse White, the marking ability, the lead up of Travis, uh, of Ben Reed is just a beautiful mark on the lead. And Travis can be brutal all around the park. Now it's back to just brutal Travis, you know. So the pressure's going to be on, on him. Significant losses. Significant. Do you think Ben Hudson will play? Up off the rookie list seemed to be the best wink or nod you could imagine heading why, into round one. Why would you bring Ben Hudson off the rookie list two days before they play Fremantle at Eddie Head Stadium? Mm. You would suspect that Ben Hudson might get a call up. You would indeed. Uh, Rodney Ede delivered the insights and the news from the Pies. He trained Friday. Um, all fine after training, all fine Mon uh, Saturday. Woke up Sunday with a bit of a tight calf. Um, he said he believes he didn't do anything on the Saturday, but uh, um, you know, another, another strange to get a tight calf in that situation. So that could have held for both of them with tight calves. One of them had the flu <laughs> earlier in the week, which okay. we told you travelled down to the yep. leg. And then I guess attention turned to the West as to who was going to catch the plane. Uh, Nat Fife, who trained with a knee guard on during the week, a knee brace, uh, he's on the flight. They're talking about Zach Clark being an emergency and Colin mm -hmm. Sylvia as well. This was Ross Lyon as the Dockers departed. No, it's more the, um, not so much pressure. Look, you know, the footy world will watch, and, uh, but that's part of it that every week. There's great expectation. No one puts more pressure on the players and the coaches and we do ourselves. The anxiety comes from we haven't seen Collingwood and they haven't seen us in real AFL games and you know situations and intensity. No, we don't we're anywhere anytime, we don't really care to be honest. Ross very ready. Do I feel ready? I'm here. If I wasn't ready I wouldn't have turned up. Thanks. <laughs> Has it recast your thinking about the game in total? No, I was probably hinting towards Fremantle. I picked them for the flag. I can't then abandon them at round one. No, no, that, that would, would be, be quite, yeah. quite, quite weak of me. Um, I, they are behind Collingwood. They are just the way they've been playing. I don't think Fremantle. Um, it's probably had the same build-up. I, I, I've noticed Ross in the last couple of days, Ross Lyon has talked about the, la the importance of the last two hit-outs. Um, he was talking like he was a horse trainer, training, training a horse to the moment. Yeah, yep. So I don't generally believe that because if you do that, you don't know what's going to happen. I think they would probably like a couple more weeks to get a little bit more sort of match-hardened. But uh, if you put Collingwood's line-up down against Fremantle's line-up, and I know they play different games of um, football, um, Fremantle, they look good. They look, they look really good. Not a bad time to have a real crack at them was Nathan Buckley's assessment. It's an interesting today. comment, Dad. I, I, I hope we, that's on the agenda when we talk to McClure and King because I don't know. If, I don't know if Buckley plays mind games. I said before with selection he doesn't. But to say that. Does it, is it worth anything? Does it, does it, does it prompt Ross to say, hey, everyone, no, they, they think we're not ready? I, I don't know any more on mind games. I, re I really don't. Do they matter? I mean, the game's so professional now. If players need to be G'd up because Buck said, oh, it's a really good time to get them. Is, is that what goes on in football? I, d I don't know. It was just logic and honesty, wasn't there? That's all it? it was. Just hit them before they're absolutely tuned. Oh, where do you want to play? Round one at Eddie Head or round 12 at bloody <laughs> Patterson yeah, Stadium? Yeah, yeah. God, yeah. Marty, you'll take Eddie Head any day of the week. <laughs>
OK, uh, for one man, I'm sure this weekend can't come soon enough. Heath Shaw is about to resume his career with the GWS Giants. He'll be part of the Derby in Sydney come the Saturday twilights. He's been a man who's had a few incarnations along the way and the latest lies ahead. Rebold in the middle, calling for the football. Schneider, will he give it to Rebold? He will. Rebold oh. runs in. Touched up the boots. Oh. It came up behind him like a librarian. Got a bit going on here by the play. Oh. Pretty comfy. I've um, I filled it out pretty well over the off season, so I've got a bit of I've got a bit of work to do. And we'll see how he sports it come game time. Heath Shaw is with us from Sydney. Uh, Heath, welcome to AFL 360. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Um, I, it must be a measure of purgatory, I think, probably waiting right through the summer and, and to get out there and play for the first time for a new club. Uh, are you counting the days? Yeah, it's, no, it's pretty exciting stuff, mate. Um, obviously, you, you train hard all pre-season for, for round one, and um, it's a bit of a special occasion for me. Obviously, training um, up at the new venue and at a new club and um, the Battle of the Bridge as well. I've got to get used to saying that sort of thing now. Um, against my brother, against the Sydney Swans, um, it's all new and, and really exciting. Hey, do you, um, do you reckon your legacy at, at Collingwood was hurt? And if so... What impetus has it given you to, to start the second half of your you know, pretty good AFL career? Um, no, to be honest, Rob, I don't think so. I'm, I'm going to be a Collingwood Premiership player no matter where I end up or where I go. Um, I've got a lot of great friends at that club and, and I've left with my head held high. And um, the support that was shown from a lot of Collingwood fans... Uh, when the decision was made um, was phenomenal and I was wrapped with that sort of response but um, now I'm a GWS player and, and hopefully I can, I can set my own legacy up, up here in the, in the lovely town of uh, Sydney um, and build a, build a great club and build a good competitive bunch of, of blokes and, and a great team. You're a bit crazy sometimes, Heath, we know that, <laughs> but you're a pretty proud footballer. How important is it to you as you embark on this, you know, how old are you? Oh, you can't admit, uh, your next five or six seasons. How important is it 21. for you? <laughs> how important is it, Heath, for you to, to grab the next five or six years of your footy career and say, hey, I achieved this at this club and I achieved it again at this club? Yeah, definitely, mate. Um, I'm looking forward to, the, to this journey I'm, I'm on now. Um, I signed a five-year deal with a, with a brand new club that, that is building and um, I want to be a part of that and I want to be a part of um, this club becoming a powerhouse in the future and um, the six months that I've spent at this club so far has been great and I'm loving the life up in Sydney, um, didn't like the beach and loving the beach now and um, the Sydney lifestyle and this great bunch of, of young guys with, with massive amount of talent but they work really hard as well and um, for, for guys that have been starved of a bit of success um, in the last three years, they're really, really looking forward to, to a big year ahead and to try and stamp their own authority on, on the AFL competition. When I want to ask about your ha behaviour, Heath, and when, uh, at the end, you know, we saw some stuff on the field and, you know, I don't know if the decision to, to, to part ways had already been made, but obviously your behaviour had been spoken about. When you're now starting again, do you have to rethink, temper the way you go about things on and off the field? Oh, you, you know me, Rob. I'm a very passionate guy, um, and sometimes I let the emotions get a hold of me. But um, as you said, this is this is a young group. Um, this is a developing group, and and I'll have to check myself a few times throughout the year. But um, once I cross that white line, I expect. Um, perfection and I expect us to, to play to the best of our ability and um, I'm not going to be afraid to tell these guys but it's there's a different way of telling such a young group and, and developing this young group into a good team. The most exciting prospect with the Giants in the short term will be the, the three Giants playing together potentially in the forward line Cameron, Patton and Boyd. Um, how soon could that happen Heath? Could it happen this weekend? <coughs> 
Um, oh, I'm not sure. I don't sit on selection, but um, they've definitely all put their hands up. Um, Johnny's sitting on the couch now. He's put his hand up. Now he <laughs> wants to play straight away, coming off a, a knee Rico and, and Boydie being the number one pick and Jezza coming off 60-odd goals last year. So it's, it's a pretty exciting prospect and it's good for defenders like me. I can just bomb it in there long and hope for the best. And um, At some point during this year, they definitely will all play together. Um, how soon, soon that is, I'm not sure, but um, it's a pretty, pretty scary prospect having those guys up there. Well, Heath, we look forward to it. We look forward to seeing how the first of many years at the Giants pans out for you. Good luck. Thanks, guys. Well done, Heath. Heath Shaw with us on AFL 360. And the Adelaide side of things. We mentioned different journeys for different players and teams now uh, as circumstances dictate. And uh, a mode of reflection today, which is obviously going to continue on for the next couple of weeks. And Sam Jacobs gave voice to how some of the players are feeling and reminiscing in the aftermath of Dean Bailey's death. I remember one game, I can't remember exactly who we were playing, but... You know, we'd had a pretty flat half and we, we hadn't been playing, you know, our best footy. And I remember he just came in the rooms and, you know, all the boys had their heads down and whatnot. And he came in and just did this little dance. So it, um, it has something that's going to stick with me forever. And, uh, you know, it's just, I think that sums him up. He just gave so much to the boys and, you know, it was a, a great moment. So it is both a time to remember and a time for the necessity of moving on for the Adelaide Crows who train today at the Adelaide Oval and the season launches tonight and that is where Brenton Sanderson, the coach, is. Uh, Brenton, we really appreciate you joining us on AFL 360. No, my pleasure, guys. Thanks for having me on. Is this a difficult reality tonight? Usually such a joyous occasion full of hope and optimism given the events of the past 36 hours? Yeah, I mean, we certainly launched the season tonight with a heavy heart and, um, you know, to lose uh, uh, an integral part of our coaching group, um, you know, on the eve of the season. Um, but seriously, I mean, footy's taken a back seat for us at the footy club in the last couple of days because, um, you know, we're really thinking about Karen and Mitch and Darcy, you know, uh, and, the, uh, and the entire Bailey family while they go through this really difficult time. There are touching scenes today. You chose to wear Dean's hat and Karen was there at training. So what was the day like? Yeah, I mean, um, I actually, I, I wasn't aware that Karen was going to be at training today. I think she was here preparing for, for Dean's uh, memorial service on Saturday. And it just so happened the timing was perfect that we were just coming out to train. And um, I, wore Dean's, uh, I wore Dean's hat today for training. And um, when Karen found that out, uh, she came down and we just had a quick, uh, a quick hug and a, just a quick photo. Um, I think that meant a lot to her and uh, yeah, it was just, I guess, for me personally, just a little uh, way that I wanted to remember Dean and just, just once I wanted uh, him to be on, uh, to, for him to be on Adelaide Oval with us. Sandow, we, we showed last night on the show the, a wonderful photo of the, the coaching group shaving their heads and I made fun of it last week when I was with you for the season launch, but I tell you what, there was no fun about it last night. It was a, it's a proud image, but it was a, and also a very, very sad image. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, it was a very difficult time for us while Dean was fighting his cancer. I guess internally we knew uh, he was finding it um, very, very difficult, but at no point did, uh, did Dean complain or did Dean uh, um, seek any attention. You know, he, he, just, he just wanted us to keep um, working as hard as we could at trying to make the footy club better and the team better. And, uh, but I guess, yeah, when he, when he started the chemotherapy and the, and the uh, radiation treatment, um, the coaches all wanted to just do something to put a smile on his face and um, so we all shaved our heads and as we joked uh, last week you know mine's not growing back but um, but most of the boys you know I think um, it was the least they could do to try and put a smile on Dean's face uh, even if it was just for one day but um, um, yeah it's uh, I guess a, re a really difficult time for our footy club uh, we're gonna we're gonna celebrate the start of the season today but um, but I guess in the back of our minds you know we're still we're still coming to grips with uh, losing a really close mate. I don't want to go on about it, but I think it's really important, Sando. You were a new coach. You'd come from Geelong. You're a new senior coach. And we spoke to Stephen Trigg about the club welcoming Dean Bailey. Even though he had a difficult time at Melbourne, the club welcomed him. Can you tell us your relationship with him and, and how far did that grow in the period you had? Was, by the end, was it like great, great mates? 
Yeah, I mean, Dean was incredible for me personally. You know, he was um, he was approached by uh, by Stephen Trigg and the board to, I guess, to assist me in my first season as rookie coach. And we had a fantastic season in 2012. You know, we played off in a prelim and, and Dean was instrumental behind the scenes to ensure that I was balanced. And, you know, there's times as a senior coach when you just need someone just to grab you and say, uh, uh, you know, you're either working too hard or you're not working hard enough. Or when I was really positive, he was just reassuring me that, you know, just, just sort of don't get too excited. And... And the days when I was really flat, uh, Dean was the one that sort of picked me up. But um, as you mentioned last night, Robbo, and, um, you know, congratulations. You guys did a great job in honouring his life last night. But um, uh, he's got, uh, or he's got, uh, I guess, uh, memories at four clubs. And for us, I guess I can only talk about our time or his, his time at Adelaide Football Club. But he touched so many people here and uh, the work he did behind the scenes to, to really help this young group evolve and, and become better people. Um, will always be remembered and uh, we're certainly going to miss him dearly. Everybody will deal with grief in their own way, Brenton. You do have a group of particularly young men, so you've got a, a bit of uh, world weariness about you, I suppose, but um, you've got teenagers and players in their early 20s who would have formed a bond here. How do you nurse them all through that? Um, well, I mean, diff it, is, it is difficult and uh, everybody handles... Uh, grief differently and um, we've put up a support network around our playing group we've got um, seven people who are obviously trained in this sort of situation and um, our players have uh, got access to these people um, 24 hours a day um, I know that uh, some of the feedback and some of the advice we've been given is to as quickly as we can get back into the routine of football and uh, you know yeah, yesterday was a really difficult day for us and as you mentioned we've got a very young group who who, uh, like all of us, were in incredible shock uh, yesterday when we found out. But, um, you know, tonight we launched the season. Uh, we train today in Adelaide Oval. Uh, the players have a day off tomorrow and um, we'll quickly prepare for Geelong in round one uh, next Thursday. But I guess that's part of my role too, is to ensure that this group, um, uh, you know, mourn as, um, as, 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 they, as, as we need to because, um, you know, we're all still coming to grips with it. But uh, we've got to make sure that we're ready for round one and um, we're going to put 22 fit players out on the park and we're going to give it a red hot crack. So the memorial service details have now been formalised and I don't doubt that there'll be a big outpouring from the football community. Um, is that That's obviously going to be part of the build up towards round one. So uh, how do you, do you separate the two or is that just sort of the necessity of life that the two will go hand in hand from here? I mean, it's a challenge because, I mean, this is new ground. I've, I've never been involved with a football club when we've uh, lost someone so close, I guess, to the coalface, you know, um, a coach who's with the players every day. I mean, we've, we've lost past board members or, um, you know, people, uh, I guess, uh, who are an extension of, of the uh, playing group. But uh, this is the first time that I've experienced, um, you know, losing a coach right on the eve of a season. So um we'll just take uh, almost each 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 minute by minute uh, each day by day um we're a really tight-knit group though you know we spent yesterday together as you know the players and coaches and um today it was great to get out and just train again um as i said we'll we'll launch the season tonight you know behind me we've got adelaide over which is really exciting but um but yeah it's 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 new territory for us as well and um i'm, I'm sure it's going to take a few days for it really to sink in and um, the memorial service is here on Saturday, which will be a great way for us to probably say our final goodbyes to Dean and, and then we'll get on with uh, doing our very best to beat Geelong in round one. So the last one. We heard last night about Dean's inf influence in coaching groups with Kevin Sheedy and particularly his calming influence on Mark Williams during their run. Um, do you know professionally where and how you'll miss him most? Um, I, I sort of miss the end of your question, Jared. There's a, it's very loud here, but um, I think you're talking about you know Dean's ability and what he meant to those people as well. But um, for me personally, um, he was a fantastic friend. Firstly, you know he he was able to um, I think I mentioned it earlier. You know he he was able to calm me down when I was too up, and he was able to pick, he was able to pick me up when I was a bit flat. But um, I think we heard last night from Choco and from Sheeds uh, how valuable a, an asset he was at um, at Port Adelaide. Uh, obviously at Essendon as well, um, and you know the the players last night. How highly they spoke of of, of Dean's ability to to um, to be a, almost a mentor for him at Melbourne. But um, um, I was lucky enough to to coach alongside him for a couple of years. As I said yesterday and and tonight, I'm I'm going to really miss him dearly because he was a fantastic friend of mine, and 
uh, my really loyal mates and um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's just a really sad time for us. Well, wish you luck with the days to come and really appreciate your time, Brenton. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks, guys. Brenton Sanderson with us on AFL 360. Our Wednesday night crew has reassembled. Mark McClure and David King. The lead-off task is to nail them. We're going to nail their foot to the floor and get them to give us their predictions for the season that's about to unfold. You got another tattoo. Yeah. Tell us. I'm gonna give me shirt off. Yeah, I'll give you shirt off. Hang on, hang on. I'll give you some money. <laughs> I'll give you fifty bucks <laughs> if you to take some of your shirt off so we can see your tattoo. Oh, a stripper. No, I'll give you more if you want. Show us your tattoo. No, I'm not, mate. I'll double. I'll double if you do it right. Go on. Hundred bucks. Hundred bucks. Five hundred. Four hundred. <laughs> Your brain is full of. You're gonna do a charity. Five hundred bucks. Well, Kingy's walking, walking the four Mr. tracks for kids tomorrow. There morning. There's a charity for Sand now, Caulfield, Flemington, Mooney Valley. Will you put five hundred up for Kingy? <laughs> You're a vile one, Mr. Grinch. <laughs> It seemed so likely, Kingy, that you were going to top up for the kids. They were so happy that were they? you'd given 500 and if you read it on air like the Royal Children's Hospital, you'd double, yeah, double it. Double it. Thousand oh. bucks. And what'd you make, Seriously, Do you know yet? Uh, I think they made about 300000 which is a great effort for the underprivileged kids. So your 500 will be fantastic. To be honest, I spoke to Sellers. Welcome, Sellers. Good to see you again for the new Thanks. year. I spoke to Sellers and we said we'd go halves, 250 each. That's no Sellers. Yeah, we spoke I tell you what, you, you, this you is, should under-promise and over-deliver, not yeah. over-promise and under-deliver. <laughs> oh, this is what next Wednesday. Kingy? Yeah, the Grinch. Grinchy. There he there is there. Please? That is him. It looks <laughs> very next, similar. Next Wednesday, 250, 250 on the table for you. On the table. For the kids. Well, oh, nice. there you go. As a result, I didn't think we'd get that. <laughs> no, I thought that was good. What are you surprised? Hang on. And what are you going to chip yeah. in, Jared? I, I, I would think 250, no 250, 250, 250, 250, 250, 250, you're in this. Jared, you're in the 250, I'm leading. Well done. Last year we asked you to do your eights at this time of year, and it panned out quite well. Six out of the eight for you, Mark. Well done, Sellers. None in the right position, but I don't think it's ever about positions. It's about whether you nail the teams or not. That's right, and Kingy, you went one better. You went, that was how you went, Sellers. Not surprising. Just got Mark again. Only missed with West Coast, which was a miss. A big miss. Yeah, Adelaide. Adelaide. Top of the table. <laughs> Adelaide there. That's not ideal. But uh, And Kingy, you landed with uh, seven out of the eight and under Price's right rules had one in the right position. It is tough, isn't it? And, and we take it too seriously sometimes. But uh, look, it's a tough gig to get them all right. You're looking at pre-season form. But injuries are the big killer. Injuries for any team are the big kill, and that's, that was the, the stumbling block for the West Coast last year. OK, we're going to build from eight upwards, but I just want to know before we start, which team has caused you the biggest amount of buyer's remorse? Oh, I think the West Coast, for me, I know you've got the West Coast in your eight sellers, and I think it's right. a good selection. Nick Nat was the, the big query. Has he got through pre-season? A lot of talk about him, and I just couldn't bring myself to, to put him above the other teams that I've got in there. But I think when they go from Warsfold to Simpson... They've virtually moved the club, and this has not been disrespectful to John Moore's fault, but they will play modern football from minute one now. I know, I know that the senior players over there are loving it. Have you got one who you were aggrieved to leave out? No. <laughs> Yes, excellent. Well, because they're start. out, they're out. They're in, they're in. You can't be half, half in and you half out. You start at eight. Oh, well, eight, so I've, gone, I've gone with Carlton. Um, they, they made the finals last year. Uh, I think they can improve. The technicality. They didn't yeah, earn it. What do you mean they didn't earn it? Anyway. You're in, you're in. Yeah, I don't Keep going. Jeez. You backed the whole side the whole year, and then you buried them this year Ooh. with the in Come the on, stay on Carlton. OK, Carlton, um, they, they, they won a final last year against Richmond, who everyone thought was going to climb the ladder pretty strongly. I thought that was a pretty good win for them. They got improvement, 10 or 12% improvement in their game through just, just sheer teamwork. They're, in, they're, they're actually... They're, they're really a poor leadership group in some ways. You know, they don't have... They're introverted. They need to get some extroverts, and I think I think Daisy Thomas adds a little bit of that for them, and I, and I think he'll 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 help the club a hell of a long way. So eighth is about their number, but I wouldn't be surprised if they went a little bit lower too, because there's a lot of sides just outside of half a chance. 
edge land than the last place in the eight. I'll put the pies. I think uh, Collingwood will take a step back this year, I think, in terms of wins and losses, but it's to take two giant ones forward in the next couple of years. I think they'll challenge for the eight, on the eight, they'll challenge for the top four, you know, in 12 months' time, not so much this year. It's Nathan's team now, um, but their record against the top eight teams over the last two years is 10 and 10. So they had to address something. They had to, in my opinion, take some gambles, let some players go, uh, make some changes, which Nathan, to his credit, has done. But I think it'll hurt them in the short term for long-term gains. And you left Collingwood out completely. Yeah. Yeah. I think they're on the slide. <laughs> Seven? I went to, uh, I didn't know where to put uh, Geelong. Um, just have lost some players and they've, uh, uh, they've got a lot of kids and, and all those sorts of things. But, you know, they've been up a long time. I mean, and it's hard to stay at this level for a hell of a long time, but I can see the transition that they've done, and they've done a very good job to place them, I think, probably around about seven or eight's their number. It might be the only time for the year that these two minds meet, but yeah. blow me down. Well, I had the Cats there at seventh. I could have them a lot higher, but I thought the supporter base already hate me, so why <laughs> disappoint them? <laughs> just, it's a free just, swing. It's <laughs> a free swing. <laughs> have them sliding a little bit. It's the youngest list they've uh, got for seven years. So that's reflective mm. of just what you said then. And I think Motlop, the big query over Motlop, who is their, their wild card? You know, he's Huge. such a massive out, isn't he? So, go, so game them, breaker. So, but they, they could be anywhere. I mean, if they get some luck with some injuries and, and things go their way, they could be a lot higher. Can I ask? Sixth? Who have you got in sixth spot? I've gone for North. Not bad. I went for North. Uh, they want to be a good side, North. They've picked up Ling to help them out with some areas. Uh, Jeff Walsh has come back to the club. They're trying to boost their, their football club and, and build their, their football department. Um, they lost so many games by so little last year, but that's their fault. Uh, they need to re address that and fix that up. Uh, look, they want to be a good team. I'm, I'm not certain that um, any other, many teams are really improving a hell of a long way, and they've got an opportunity to do so. Their youth and pace is a key. Thank you. Well said, King. The Bombers for me, I, I like the Bombers this year. I think that, uh, you know, I think Bomber Thompson back there, he, he's just got his hands on everything that's going on. The players are loving it. It's a different brand of footy, slightly to what they've played the last couple of years. And I think that the bookends will decide how they go. Hurley and Danaher, if they can stand up all year and have good, solid seasons and play most games, and I think that they'll, uh, they'll really challenge. There'll be, there'll be a stage in the year where you think they can win it. I'm not sure whether they can last the distance. They haven't the last couple of years, so I want to see it first, but uh, I've got them in sixth. You've got two bolters. The first one is in fifth spot. Who is it? West Coast. Um, look, I think the change of coach has been perfect for them. They've got a reasonable bunch of players. They, they were played so poorly last year, it was unbelievable. The year before, I thought they were reasonable. Uh, we all short, think they'd shot up the ladder, but uh, maybe a year too late. So uh, Johnny mm -hmm. loses his job. Uh, and, and look, he was worn out anyway, so I think he was, and, and a fresh face is going to bring him along quite nicely. I think they're a real chance. Tigers for me, I think that uh, they've built perfectly. You know, they probably should finish top four if all things go their way, but I've got them in fifth. They've gone six wins, eight wins, ten wins and fifteen wins under Damien Hardwick, and I, I think it's the perfect build. I think that uh, they're coming along beautifully. Vickery and Rewalt will be the talking point all year. If Vickery can actually be a goal kicker, not just one and a half goals on average a week, if he can kick 45 to 50 goals for the year, they become a real contender. But there's still that doubt there. You know, your mate Jack is going to play a lot further from goals and just not sure whether... It's a very good media band he put on himself. <laughs> He wishes you'd put one on about him as well. Uh, and Martin no, I haven't finished with him yet. <laughs> you haven't finished. I think you've finished him. Um, yeah, Martin halfback's a bit of a risk because he's the only one that looks like breaking a game in that midfield when, uh, when they're in trouble. So we just to see how they go. Their problem is they're going to play all the top eight sides twice. Or, they got, you know, more they of those. They've got the second easiest draw Ooh. in the comp next year. Yeah, where'd you get that from? Where'd you, get, where'd you pluck that from? Where'd you get that from? Yeah. Maybe I misread that. <laughs> <laughs> Right, okay. Take us to the top four. <laughs> four. Oh, I've gone for Sydney. I think Sydney will hang in there in the top four. I'm not certain that um, everything's kosher up at Sydney at the moment with, uh, with, uh, Bud with Buddy. Yeah, well, I don't know. If you get $10 million, you become a, a different sort of person outside with the playing group. You do. Automatically, you do. So you've got to hold your end up and actually play very, very well uh, or else it's going to go a bit sour. But I think they're, they're a strong enough side. They've got a good enough playing list. And uh, their last year, they hung in there pretty well with a lot of injuries to finish in that spot as well, so in the, in the top four. So I'll make fourth. I've got the Kangas in there. I think they'll have a really good year. They've had a good base. Last year was fantastic. They lost 10 games by under three goals. A little bit of luck here and there. And, uh, and their senior players on the park. I think the year again, if you're going to put it to players, uh, we've, you've talked about the off-field already. Mm. They've made some big gains there. Mm. I think if Jack Zeeble can replace uh, Andrew Swallow for that 
first four, six, eight weeks, yeah. whatever it turns out to be, then I think they'll have a great year. If he can't, then I think they'll be back to that pack that we talk about anywhere from 5 to, to 12th on the ladder. So if there's one person you want to put under the hammer, it's him. But there's yeah, no excuses good. this year. Yeah. There, really, there really isn't. They've, they've spent where they needed to spend. Um, you know, Brad's been there quite some time now. It's, it's really time. How has he been there? Five? Uh, he's been four? there four. I think this is four. his fifth coming. They've, got, they've gone 11 wins, 10 wins, 14 wins and 10. So it's been a little bit up and down, mm. different to Richmond's build. So th this is the year they need to fire. Okay, so that's your bolter for the top four. Yours? Adelaide's at three. Adelaide's my bowler. I think Taylor Walker's returning. And, and Eddie Betts is a good pick-up for them. Really mm. fits in perfectly. I think their midfield's reasonably strong. Uh, I think they've got some good kids coming through and Crouch and a few other young guys around the place. I think that they're a, they're a real chance to jump up. They, they've played in the preliminary final the year before and just fell off the pace completely. That's sort of unusual for what you would see for Adelaide. I thought the Hawks would slide a little bit this year given that they've, they've allowed Buddy to go. But... You watch them through pre-season, you think, you know, I just can't bring myself to put them too far down the ladder. I've got them in, in third. Their pressure's better than what we give them credit mm. for, so what they do without the ball is probably better than what they do with it, and we talk about that all the time. In the past 50 years, there's only been five teams go back-to-back -back and one three-peat. So it's incredibly different, difficult for them to go on and, and win it. But I tell you what, if there's one person that could do it, Alistair Clarkson, as a coach, could mm. orchestrate something quite, uh, quite special. You've got them in the top two, Salas? Yeah, I have. I've got them to run second. Um, I think they'll play off with Freo Mantle again. I think they're the best two sides of the competition by a mile, and that was proven last year uh, quite clearly. Uh, so sides have got to improve a hell of a lot to catch them, and these guys are still trying to improve again. So I think that uh, Hawthorne will play off, but it's hard to win two in a row, hard to stay up for as long as they have. And since 2008, they've been right up amongst the best sides in the competition, and they pulled off uh, what they wanted to pull off, and sometimes it's hard to motivate after that too. Yeah, how many premierships did you play in? Oh, right Quickly. Right. Just, I can't remember, mate. It's a long time ago. Um, <laughs> the point, three. point I'm making is, going for back-to-back, -back, you didn't achieve it. Yes, we did. What, what year? 81, 82. 82. Anyway, on to you, Get your facts right. <laughs> second. His memory come good pretty quickly. Um, Freo, I had second. Now, look, this is a raffle. You yeah, know, it Sydney is. And Freo, it's a real raffle, but I just think... I just think Fremantle might take a while to build into the season. I think they'll, they'll really fly home in terms of wins and losses in the home and away. It's not about that. But I think it's really critical that they finish second, not third. They need to make sure they get that home uh, prelim final. They've got 20 players who are over 25 years of age. This is a list that's the oldest in the competition. It, it's been Ross lined, if you like. It's been tuned up to actually win one. Not to develop, but to win one. And, you know, Gumbledon's gone down. Sylvia's there now to make a difference. This list has to, has to win a flag in the next couple of years, otherwise uh, it'll all be for naught. They probably should have won last year when you look at the game. Mm. Yeah, again, and the Hawks have, have got that one and moved on, but it, their time is now, so I've got them in second. I've gone. I, I think uh, Freo will win it, uh, is, is my top pick. But and, and, and exactly what you said, I watched the replay of the game again on Fox the other day and just had a quick look at it and didn't they blow some goals and mm. poor players, you know, like, and they'd be, they'd be, they'd be smarting this week. I tell you, they'll be, they'll be ready to go Friday night. Uh, and I think they'll give Collingwood a good whopping on Friday night. Set, set, a, set a pattern for the year because Ross Lyon, was, I was just watching him on telly, he was sort of half smug and smirk and he, he thinks that they're ready to roll. Uh, and they like to, they'd like to set the record straight that they'd like to win one. But they need to fix up a few things. They need to kick a score in a big game, which would be handy. Finishes off. Uh, the Swans for me. I think that they've got the absolute perfect build at the moment. You look at last year's All-Australian squad, their first three pick midfielders were in there and their first two half-back flankers mm. were in there. It's, it's absolutely brilliant. Their core of midfielders are all in the right age. Jack, Kennedy, Hanbury, you know, Mitchell coming on to be a real star. Lewis Cheddar, I think, will have a better year again. Injuries crueled them last year. And, and whether, you, whether you think the Buddy Franklin move is a great move financially or, or, or not, it doesn't really matter. It's all about preliminary final week mm. for a player like Buddy. And I just can see him just priming himself. For me, he looks miles away from his best form now, mm. but he'll be, he'll be in that Sydney system for another three or four months and he'll be right to go. And what's not a good colour if you've got a little bulge? <laughs> you we know that, Kingy, and I know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're both on the board and we will promise to hold it against you all year. No Port Adelaide from either no, of you. No, and the no, rest I, was I think it a tough, mix and match tough draw. They and and, and Richmond... Tough. Collingwood and Rich and, and go, Richmond mate. all went out. <laughs> right, we've got a cut, mate. We've got a cut. See you on Friday oh, night on here on Fox Footy. We're going to take a little divergence next because as well as the footy, the F1 Grand Prix, the first race of the season. And David Coulthard is here with us. So a bit of racing royalty with Robbo next.
Sky being played for the Flying Scotsman Coulthard to end McLaren's 50 race Grand Prix drought. It is a brilliant success. Fantastic. This is actually a better feeling than when I won the first Grand Prix for William. One, because it was a little bit unexpected here at the first race. It left David Coulthard 11 seconds out in front, a lead protected through 10 faultless laps. David Coulthard crosses close to the flag because it is his victory. It would be right in every sense to say we're gearing up for the weekend. Not only the return of the AFL, but the first race of the Formula One season, the Australian Grand Prix, and we couldn't let the chance pass to chat with one of the greats of the sport, a two-time winner at Albert Park, and now commentating for the BBC, David Coulthard. Welcome. Thank you. How many years have you been coming to Australia? Uh, well, I first came here in 86, uh, racing carts in uh, Geelong, which is not mm -hmm. too far from here, mm -hmm. I don't think. So I uh, first fell in love with the country yeah, back then. Um, and uh, then obviously from Grand Prix point of view I've been coming here since what 94 so you must have come across Aussie rules just from time to time well whenever I'm down here I'm very keen and I'm seeing oh, yeah, my favourite magazine well, yeah. and uh, you know I, I'll this throw it was... at you and you're going to catch it <laughs> Ready? It's going to bounce off my you head. Don't put your hands up. Well, man, we're that close. You're like, oh, you. <laughs> See how hard he threw that? that? You know, he's four then. <laughs> I didn't know you were going to hit me on the chest. What are you supposed to put Why You were so there? gentle with me in the toilets earlier. <laughs> Why are you wanting to hurt me now? Dave. <laughs> Um, you do know when you come over here that this sport exists. Do you, do you, did you feel as what's in the papers, but on the radio? Do you listen to the radio or anything when you come over here? Well, I see it in the papers. Mm -hmm. I can see that Australia, and especially Melbourne, is like the sports capital of the world, isn't it? You know, you've got so many great sports down here, and uh, you, you can see in all the papers, you see on the television, uh, incredible, athletic, strong men, and that's the reason why I would never have been cut out for anything <laughs> like that. You know, I was always a bit more delicate and built for being wrapped inside a carbon fibre tub and let the engine do all the powerful stuff. When you were growing up, obviously you were into cars. Did you play any other sports? A little bit at school, football, rugby, you know, that sort of thing. But I started karting at 11. And, uh, you know, you've got to be pretty focused if you're trying to do something properly. So I broke my collarbone playing football and my father wasn't too impressed because it meant I missed a couple of races. So after that, I tended to duck out of any of the, the sort of team school sports. What about Union? Uh, no, I didn't, um, you know, I didn't really get involved too much. I did one short tree rugby match where we went into the scrum down and I'd fallen because it was a public park. I'd fallen in some, some dog dirt. And it was on the side of my shorts, and I was getting trying to get it cleaned Dog off. Dude. My, yeah, Is that what you exactly. Call it in well, I, I don't know if you call it poo. Can you say poo? <laughs> no, on the I don't show? swear. Oh, yeah, sorry. Show, anyway, David. and I, so I said to the second was, "Look, sorry guys, I'll, I'll go and change my shorts." And the guy behind he was like, "Just scrum down." You know, they were so focused on the game, Head in the and he had it down the side of his ear and everything. And I'm thinking. If you don't really ask for me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as I'm crying in the shower, trying to get dog dirt off my leg, it was, you know, no, I, I realised, again, motor racing. You won for the first time here in 1997. Does it feel like 17 years ago, or is it still fresh when you come to Melbourne each time? It's fresh. Some other Grand Prix I don't really remember, but Melbourne, it's such a great place to start the season. There's so much excitement when you come to the city. I'm not just saying nice things because I'm sitting here in your, your studio. They're genuinely, when you've come this far, you really want to enjoy your time here. So, uh, you know, whether it was winning here in 97, whether it was the embarrassment of switching places with Hacken in 98, I won here again in 2003. So it's always been a great place for me to come. And, uh, you know, people here are pretty friendly. There's a few protesters occasionally, but uh, even they have a smile on their face, so it's okay. Now, you've got to give them points for resilience. They've still, yeah. still been coming. Do you like the, the, um, the city tracks, you know, the, mm -hmm. the town tracks or the, or the circuits more? I like the street circuits and I've always tended to, to go well where there's very fixed boundaries. So you can't argue with an Armco barrier or a wall, it doesn't move. Where on some of the modern circuits, you have these big runoff areas, yeah, so you yeah. can just push the limits until you find out, oh well, it didn't get away with it, I'll just come back a bit the next lap. So, you know, Monaco, I was lucky enough to win a couple of times, and in lower formula, I won some uh, street races as well. So I think that type of constraints, for me, works well. I remember, I was, I was, I was a huge Ant and Senna fan, and you replaced Senna at, at Williams after, after the crash. How significant a moment was that for Formula One racing? Because the Senna documentary was one of the most, we were talking about it before, it's one of the most in-your-face sports documentaries 
you could see just you know the behind the scenes footage of talking to the drivers and the fears that day or the fears that weekend how significant was that for the sport and how significant was it for you in your career well, from the sport's point of view, there hadn't been a fatality in Formula One for several years. And on the Saturday, Roland Ratzenberger, an Austrian mm. driver, was killed. And so the sport was already in complete shock. And then when the greatest driver at that time w was killed, uh, you, everyone knew that if he could be killed in a racing car, mm. then any of us could be killed in a racing car. And that coincided. I was his test driver. I'd worked with them developing the, the, uh, the car at the beginning of the season. And of course, I was in awe of, of his mm. achievements and the way he worked with the engineers was just incredible. But sadly, through his death, that was the launching pad for, for my career. And, you know, it's 20 years now since Isn't that accident. Really? Yeah. Time oh, yeah, flies. As a commentator, the, the new incarnation of the sport. Now, we presume this is going to be highly volatile because virtually everything has changed. And I'm not sure whether the testing's given much of a picture. Could anybody win this weekend? Yeah. Literally anyone could win this weekend because in pre-season testing, no one has done a full Grand Prix distance. So imagine going to do anything. Imagine trying to, you know, take a plane across the Atlantic or something when it's never actually done that sort of distance before. It's a similar situation here. So any of the teams that can get their car to the finish is in with a real chance of getting points. And I, I predict that we'll have half the field only finish, if that. Two things. How did you replace the adrenaline in your life? I didn't, uh, and I didn't look to replace that adrenaline. You know, driving a Formula One car and competing at that level was all-consuming. It takes total dedication, focus, selfishness. You it right away. Yeah, I, you know, I've got a five-year-old son. Uh, I got married last November uh, after dating for eight years. I was eight told, years. I was We're going to get that onto, a se onto that lifestyle in a second. <laughs> yeah. Um, Talk about the adrenaline first. Yeah. Why so, might even be so combined? I, yeah, well, absolutely, yeah. She's very tall, my wife, actually. And she, when she gives me the eye, that's an adrenaline rush. <laughs> I don't mean in a good you way, which is not happening. Do you reckon you're a good-looking soul? Because she's gorgeous, isn't she? She's lovely. I I think how, did you, how, did you, how did you find her? I, her eyesight's not that good. <laughs> and uh, I think she's just she's a sucker for the Scottish accent. Uh, you, I heard you were pissed in the pub one night. She's oh, like, oh, hey. Lucky dip. <laughs> <laughs> what was life? Now, that's great to talk about the mechanics and the fears and, 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 and your life there. But a lot of people out there follow Formula One and we follow the not just the racing, but the, there's a real lifestyle to it. You got married, when did you meet your wife? Eight years ago? Well, I actually met her 10 years ago, but it took yes. me a couple of years to persuade her to stand still long enough so I could yeah. touch her. No, well done. Kiss her. Kiss her. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. The lifestyle of a uh, Formula One driver, single-ish, single, mm. around the world, is it what it, most of us think it would be? Yeah. It is. <laughs> what do you think it could be? <laughs> oh my God, you've quite a... <laughs> Imaginative mind. <laughs> there was never that many involved. Uh, wasn't it? No. No. But is it a good lifestyle? It is. It's a fantastic yeah. lifestyle. But rich, uh, well, you know, see the world. I mean, everything. See the world. Beautiful women. Um, race cars, 200, 300 miles an hour. It's, it's like, I don't know how to give perspective. Seriously, how to give a serious, serious question? Perspective on your life. Simply because all of that good stuff, being paid to be a sportsman, whether it's footy or whether it's racing cars or whatever it happens to be, any sportsman is, is gifted to be paid to do what they love doing. Mm -hmm. I never raced for the money. You know, I always took the view that I raced for the pure pleasure of the competition and I was paid to do promotional events. It's how I compartmentalised it in, in my life. Um, but as you know, when, when you have to be really focused on something, the end reward can look like it just came easy. But the reality is, for me, it was a journey that started at 11 years old in Scotland mm. and took me to the point at 24 when I got to Formula One. And it was total dedication and focus at the expense of a normal childhood. I'm not, you know, I don't yeah. want anyone to feel sorry for me. I love my childhood, but I wasn't doing, you know, school sports yeah. and going on school holiday trips and things like that. I was building my car, stripping yeah. it, cleaning it, preparing. Understanding the car. Yeah, of course, absolutely. That, that, that'd be quite an enormous challenge, wouldn't it? To do anything properly, you've got to know what you're dealing with intimately. And again, if you bring it back to, you know, you, you gentlemen working together or 
a relationship with your wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever it happens to be, you know, to have anything anything really working well you've got to know that situation intimately mm. no we haven't figured each other out yet david great of you to stop by i, I doubt you'll do another interview like yeah, this sure Perhaps will, all year, but hey, so. i'm just worried you're going to hit me with the ball <laughs> oh, again okay, on. enjoy the race <laughs> on sunday hey, <laughs> thanks very much david coulthard with us on <laughs> afl 360 <laughs> tomorrow night is fight night always on thursdays we'll have cam mooney and barry hall looking ahead to the first weekend of the James Moffat's helmet at the desk throughout the week because he's got 360 on the back. How could we not? Yeah. I've got a hunch you enjoyed that. Ride. I'd like to be a race car driver. Yeah, yeah. What about you? I no, could see you, Muscles. No, not for me. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, Guy McKenna, the Suns coach. Yep. Very. Look forward to that. Yep. Sandy Roberts is going to come in and join us for the weekend mm, forecast. Looking forward to that very much. Fast so. and Cam to have a look toward round one. What I'm looking forward to is what comes next. The best TV is when you just never quite know what might happen. And on that note, I give you Bounce with Jason Dunstall. <laughs>